There are quite a few positive aspects to the white paper uh, and in fact more positive than I think many of us feared before the document came out. It's got a good quality strategic analysis of the region uh, and in fact I think it's the best thing that uh, this government has actually said in terms of uh, talking about regional security. The Asian Century White Paper I think took a, a far too benign view about what was going on in the region and the national security strategy was really almost an after the fact justification for significant cuts to defence spending. In the Defence uh, White Paper 2013 I think we get probably the most realistic assessment that this government has made about regional security. Yes, it's been rather amusing to hear some comments from uh, Stephen Smith in uh, his post-media uh, discussions on the Defence White Paper. He's quoted me a couple of times as saying that the White Paper is strategically perfect. Um, I don't actually think I said that. Um, I've said that it was pretty good um, and for me that does reflect uh, reasonably high praise but it is also flawed in some respects too. For example I think it missed an opportunity to speed up the process of cooperation with the US Marines and Air Force in the north of the country. So strategically perfect no uh, but I'll stick with my description of pretty good on the strategy. Unfortunately there are some quite serious negative aspects to the white paper and most of those go in the area of its treatment of long-term defence budgeting. Essentially that has been taken out of the white paper and I think that's very unfortunate because really the government is uh, issuing a whole series of blank checks for multi-billion dollar acquisitions in the form of uh, submarines and other uh, equipment acquisitions which are not catered for in uh, future defence budgets once we move outside of the four-year period of the forward estimates. Now Stephen Smith has said that uh, this is it's not unusual that governments would not make these long-term planning projections uh, but in fact in Australia both coalition and Labor governments in 2000 and again in 2009 did long-term 20-year projections of defence funding. I think that is an essential element of predictable defence funding in Australia and it's really it's the other half of the coin after you've made the the big equipment decisions you then need to explain how you propose to to buy these things. Defence has shed I think uh, quite a deal of the pain in terms of spending cuts over the last few years and really that's been one of the problems is that the 2009 white paper plan uh, significantly increased the amount of uh, money spent on defence and said that that increase would stay in place for, for many years. Almost from the minute the ink was dry on the 2009 white paper, uh, budget cuts have taken what uh, Mark Thompson estimates as about $24 billion out of defence forward planning. So there's a real mismatch here. I think it's reasonable at a time of financial austerity that defence should make a contribution but it has been cut and cut and cut again and we're really now at a point that the budget is simply not able to pay for the equipment plans and none of those changed. Uh, the government made a point of saying uh, that there was continuity between the 2009 plan and 2013. Uh, so you know that's the nature of the problem is that, uh, is that the money simply isn't there. The opposition's position on defence spending is frankly no more credible than the government's um, and that is to say that they have said that they will not cut defence further, the government says that. The opposition has also declared uh, what it calls an aspiration to increase defence expenditure to about 2% of uh, gross national product but they haven't specified a year. Uh, and it seems to me the problem is if you don't actually say precisely when you intend to do that, it's not so much an aspiration, it's really a hallucination. Um, what the government should do and what the opposition should do is actually give us the year when they intend to start bringing defence spending back into positive growth. It's not going to happen by accident, they actually need to decide how they're going to make it happen.
There's no doubt that the 2013 white paper has a, a more benign assessment of China than was the case in the 2009 white paper. I tend to think that people's memories are a little faulty about what was in the 2009 white paper. It wasn't terribly critical of China, but there was some background discussion. There was comments from Prime Minister Rudd at the time. Uh, there was a sort of background media briefings up in the press gallery when the 2009 white paper was released, all of which pointed to a much more um, a strong set of concerns about uh, China in the 2009 white paper. Now, my, my own view is that it's not smart to use white papers as a vehicle for creating unhappiness or enmity in the region. These are public documents, um, and in stepping back a little bit uh, to describe a more benign China, I think what the 2013 white paper is doing is actually correcting something of a mistake in uh, the appearance, if not in the substance, of the 2009 statement. The paper continues to put a lot of emphasis on the importance of the US alliance and says that the US is going to be the most important factor for strategic stability in the Asia-Pacific for the foreseeable future. Some people say that that reflects a backtracking from the 2009 document where the US is uh, written about more, but in fact I think we see broad continuity there in terms of the treatment of the American alliance. It is still central to defence thinking and planning and that's not been changed in the 2013 white paper. An area where some new cooperation with the US is identified is in space and that's largely going to happen around the relocation of a space situational awareness radar to Exmouth in Western Australia. This is opening up, I think, new possibilities for Australia-US defence cooperation. And I think the aim will be to build a cooperative relationship very, sig very similar to the signals intelligence model. It's a new field and I think a very positive one. In the white paper, the government announces uh, the purchase of an additional 12 Super Hornets, these ones to be equipped with a Growler electronic warfare technology. I actually think that it's a sensible purchase. It's a very useful capability. It means that the Australian Air Force will be the only other Air Force other than the US Air Force to operate the Growler system. Uh, so it is, um, I think, a good move. The problem though is that um, it's going to create a, a financial difficulty for the government in later years, particularly when it comes to making decisions about the numbers of joint strike fighters that it's going to purchase. I noticed Stephen Smith talking about 70 joint strike fighters at the press conference for the white paper. That's 30 less than has usually been spoken about up until now. So a, a less positive impact of the uh, Super Hornet decision is now we will probably get uh, something like 30 fewer joint strike fighters in the future. Submarines are a major part of the white paper announcements and the government has said in effect that they're now going to take off the table the lowest cost and simplest options which would have been to buy an overseas design. What's still on the table is now um, an indigenous design or a modified Collins class submarine. The difference between the high end and the low end is billions of dollars and really we, we, we have no insight based on the white paper to understanding how it is that the government has come to that conclusion. Certainly one thing I will say is not sustainable and that is the claim that we will continue to buy 12 submarines. That, that is just simply a fantasy now. Uh, it may have some positive electoral impact in South Australia but it's not borne out by the reality of the defence budget. The paper coins a new phrase about cyber security. It talks about the levers of cyber power and it renames the Defence Signals Directorate the Australian Signals Directorate. I think what that's pointing to now is a sense that uh, cyber is, as it were, emerging from its defence origins into a broader national security concept. But, you know, there needs to be more to that than simply changing the name of an organisation. We do need to understand how this process is going to create a national cyber capability. Uh, the white paper points in some in interesting directions, but we really don't have much of a sense of the detail at this stage.